what do we do about extended adjuvant therapy now? I mean, you know, we have on the one hand all of this data with tamoxifen and a meta-analysis that shows it's a benefit. And now we have a bunch of trials that just came out. And we had MA17R that one of us will talk about at some point. And now we have data on randomized data from extended adjuvant therapy, five versus 10 years that's come out at San Antonio. Do you want to talk about B42 to start us off? Kim? Oh, oh, yeah. sure. Sorry. So um, basically, you know, across all of the studies, so I think we should focus on the um, five versus 10 studies right. first. So B42 was a study that looked at, everyone had to have at least two years of aromatase inhibitor, if I remember correctly. And then we're randomized, <coughs> assuming that they were free of disease at five years to either continuing aromatase inhibitor or placebo. And what we really saw was a small, but I think meaningful benefit. I think that um, the p-value may or may not have reached statistical significance. You probably know the numbers better than I do. But at least what we saw was a, a tiny benefit for the addition of adjuvant um, aromatase inhibitor. And the benefit, in my mind, is mostly in prevention. And I'll say this theme quite a bit, which is that we're creating a whole population of breast cancer survivors who are at risk of a secondary breast cancer. And if they have residual breast tissue, I think all of the studies we're going to talk about today, one of the major drivers for that very small difference in breast cancer-free survival is really the prevention of a secondary breast cancer. So at least in my mind, the five versus 10-year Adam Atlas, as you said, meta-analysis, whether you're using tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor, needs to at least the extended use needs to be discussed with patients at five years. Right. So I mean, so Atidia, someone walks into your door, bilateral mastectomy. Okay, it's had a bilateral oh. mastectomy, and she walks in ear positive breast cancer five years ago, and she comes in and she says, oh, I have such terrible hot flashes. I'm so miserable. You know, Dr. Bardia, <laughs> do I need, really need to continue? You know, so this is, again, and she's, she's postmenopausal, not pre. Let's start with post. And she what saw you? Dr. Blackwell, who said, you must stay on this Yeah, medicine. Dr. Blackwell was not really nice to her. <laughs> she said, Dr. Dr. Blackwell, Blackwell said. So she's coming for a second, energy. she flew yeah. all the way up from Raleigh up to Mass General to talk to you. So what do you do? What do you tell her? So I think it's interesting. I think, you know, if we think about the MA17R and NSABP2, um, these are trials where you, essentially it's a situation <coughs> where you can use the trial to justify either decision. Yeah. Um, if you are a believer in extended adjuvant therapy AI, you can look at MA17R and NSABP42 and say, oh, there was a significant difference. It was statically significant in MA17R and borderline significant in B42, but you can say that there was a 3% difference, which would be clinically meaningful for my patient, so we should do it. But on the other hand, you can look at the same data and make a case we should not be doing it because, oh, it was not statistically significant, 3% uh, is not that important here, we are subjecting patients to extended AI therapy for five years, concern about hot flashes, as you were saying, osteopenia. So I think it's, it's a situation where um, it's a bit of art of medicine, depending on the particular risk that the patient has, the benefit that you would see the adjuvant AI would add, and the potential risk in terms of their risk for osteopenia, their per personal interest, how well they tolerated five years of AI. I think all of these factors need to be taken into account to make that decision. So long answer to your question, because it's, it's pretty complicated. So the issue is that I'm just curious what you guys say. I mean, Mark, you know, are you guys worried that there wasn't statistical significance in B42? Does no. that bother you? I don't know, not particularly, because I think you know, worshiping at the, at the altar of the .05 kind of sometimes doesn't make sense. I mean, the question is, do you really think that this was a spurious result? And particularly given that you've got other data from other places suggesting that this works. So I'm not so worried about the level of significance. I am more worried about what Aditya says, which is, you know, the benefits are tiny, just like we were saying with chemotherapy and these discordant groups that we're looking at the genomic assays in. And, you know, as we all know, I mean, aromatase inhibitors are not much fun for a lot of people. And we haven't even talked about the premenopause of women who want to get pregnant or something like that. And so, you know, you have to have a default setting when you're talking to the patient. You, know, you have to have, you can't probably just throw it in front of them and say, you decide. I mean, you have to have some version of right. what you think should be done. And, and given the data, I think the default setting is probably for extended therapy. But you also have to acknowledge that the benefit is small and that if somebody decides they want to walk away from that, they're not necessarily foregoing a, a huge benefit. Okay. Yeah. You guys would agree? Yeah, yeah and I, I, we just finished talking about genomic assays. Right. I think this is where um, I'm a 
from a biology standpoint, I'm a little confused as to what to do. If I've sent an oncotype five years ago and it's low risk, the other interpretation of, of a low recurrence score is that's a very endocrine hormonally driven cancer. And so, you know, those low risks, we don't really have that integrated into B42 or MA17. So we have to be a little careful about, mm -hmm. oh, it was low, therefore you won't benefit from extended, when in fact, you might, those might be the very women, we see them every day. I mean, I teach my fellows, why do we see people at six years? Because that's when the breast cancer comes back because we've stopped the endocrine therapy at five years. Honestly, I just saw two patients in clinic yesterday tamoxifen for five years, two years later, lung, sternal, yep. bone mets. And so I, I know that's a bias, but that's what we see. We see we don't see the women that go on and live forever off endocrine therapy. We see the women who go off of it and it comes back and they're exquisitely sensitive. So I guess, you know, my two take home points about extended, adju extended adjuvant endocrine therapy are, I personally do not, separate from hot flashes and bone loss and all of that, at least we didn't see a survival detriment. Right. I just want to be clear. I didn't see a signal. It was not power to show, you know, but that's one thing. And then the second thing is I would be a little cautious about using the 21 gene predictor to predict who might benefit from extended right. adjuvant therapy or not, because for me, the low score means you have an exquisitely hormone-sensitive breast cancer. And that's where the prediction of the 21 gene for extended age, I think, falls short. So would you use, I mean, there is, you know, it's actually approved by Medicare, breast cancer index, yeah. which is an H over I ratio. Do you guys use that? Anybody use that? Mm -hmm. Use so, H over I ratio? So we have started using it. Because Dennis um, Roy, who's at Mass General, helped yeah. develop it. So yeah, you guys use it? So we've started using it because we face with decision, as you were saying, you have a patient who comes in clinic, has completed five years of NAI therapy, should we consider 10 years of AI versus not? And if the patient is having some side effect, and you just have to be careful about making the recommendation of five additional years. So in that situation, the BCI can be helpful because at least you have some data that can support the decision of using extended adjuvant therapy. Yeah, I found it helpful. I mean, when so you, you look at it. the results in the extended setting, it's a pretty, you know, if I remember correctly, it's like 5% risk versus 13% risk. And I mean, that, that I think for the patient who's not tolerating the therapy, that can be very helpful. Um, the patient who's not tolerating that you actually want them to stop the endocrine therapy of five years, um, I think that could be con helpful to the patient in deciding to stop it. So, yeah, I think it's a, a good assay, and as, especially given the very small separation of the curves of B42, we need something to help us either make it wider or at that five-year point. So I'll end this section by saying that B42 actually, NSABP is now thinking of actually actively planning, um, looking at the tissue blocks from B42 and doing a very similar trial to the bake-off that was done with TransATAC. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we're going to have some data in the not-too-distant future to help us figure this out once and for all, which I think will be really good. Can I ask you one question about this? So do you keep doing bone protection if you Well, there you go. That's the next question. Time? I was going to ask that. We <laughs> might as well talk about it for a minute. We've got to do some medicine. This is advanced breast cancer. We've got to get to metastatic at some yeah. point. But, but the thing is that, you know, I would use it again. I Five years, three to five years of some sort of bone protection. What do you do after five? Because you know the longer we use it, the more chance of atypical femoral fracture. And so the yeah. issue is that... It's a, I mean, where does that, that's a great question right. because ost, when you look at MA17, the biggest side effect was osteoporosis. Right. You know, that was the real trade off. If, if you're doing 15 years of an AI, I think the osteoporosis rates were fairly substantial. But remember, MA17 was long before the denosumab prophylaxis right. study. So right. I think the reality is we know that the majority of bone loss with aromatase <coughs> inhibitor occurs within the first two years of the estrogen deprivation right. on an AI. So I'm actually stopping the bone productive agent at five years and following, I'm a once a year bone density person. They allow that? Your insurers allow that? Yes. Good for you. Wow, man, I should move to North yeah, Carolina. It's great insurance. South. You should move south. Because usually most of them, well, I don't know what it is in your guys' part of the country, but in, in Western Pennsylvania, it's probably, we can only get it every two to three years, so they won't pay for it. I still pull out those ASCO guidelines for bone health that are really? now 10 years old that say women on AI are at high risk and should have annual bone mineral density. Wow. It's been good enough.